Hey, welcome back to the podcast, Game Changers. This is part two of two episodes with retired U.S. Army Major General Daryl Guthrie. We had a great conversation in the first episode. We talked about uh, our security here in the United States and how we're strong and where we have some opportunities. And this episode, we're going to talk about leadership. And from Mr. Guthrie's experience and past in military, he has significant and extensive leadership experience. And I love his leadership philosophy. We're going to get into that right away. But before we do, just a quick uh, reminder, Mr. Guthrie, uh, retired U.S. Army Major General, two-star general, is part of this think tank called AD3. Advanced Dynamic Defense Defense Directorate. That is a mouthful, yeah. man. That's why, that's why 83. <laughs> we're, is we're just going to go with 83, <laughs> which is a national security think tank and business incubator, which really is so impressive that you're part of that and re really focused on what, it, what do we need to do in this country to to protect ourselves and to move forward and so that and you know everything else you're doing thank you again for your service uh all your time in the military and everything that you've done and continue to do and i'm really excited to talk about this uh leadership philosophy that you have so daryl guthrie welcome back great to have you hey jeff i'm so glad to be back yeah so let's get right into the five points. Describe for us what are the five points of your leadership philosophy? Yes, the uh, so the five points are uh, you know they're be optimistic and proactive, uh, address challenges at the lowest level possible, uh, take administrative and logistics function seriously and that one might be a little bit more addressed to being in the military but i th do think it can apply to well, other organizations and so so explain a little bit about what that means because i you know the first couple of points be optimistic and proactive like that's self-explanatory address challenges at the lowest level possible which certainly is the sign of a strong leader that goes back to the simon senek leaders eat last, right? I mean, you always want to be a servant leader and help those that you're responsible for. I mean, the greatest reward as to a leader is to see those who you're responsible for move on, move on and move up. Um, but number three, the logistics function, that's a, that's a little bit muddy for some of us. So elaborate on that if you don't mind. Yeah. So in the military, in the military, uh, when I would say administrative functions to my people. So some of that's outward facing, but what I was really talking about was inward facing. And, and uh, you know, it's, do you get paid on time? And in the Army Reserve, there's some forms a commander has to sign and they get submitted and then the pay is done. Mm -hmm. It's making sure that people get their evaluations on time and and making and making sure that if they've done a good job, it's recognized. And then on the logistics side, you know, if you're going someplace uh, to a national training center or maybe even uh, de deploying downrange, there are a lot of logistics things that have to happen. And, and I think so many times, in in the military, at least, uh, you can just forget you can forget that someone is working on those. Mm -hmm. So there's some that, that, that's their their entire job. Yeah, is to and make sure working. that every all the supplies, all the equipment, vehicles, uh, whatever, are all lined up, ready to go when it's when it's time. And and too many times we take that for granted. You know, we just assume that all of that's going to get taken care of. And and you never take the time really to walk over and say thanks to the people that, that do that kind of, do those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So that's really where I was coming from with that was part of my philosophy because I had been part of some units that that was, if there was 
those two things were where lower performing units always seem to fall short, but high performing yeah. units always did those two things very well. Interesting. Where one is in order and everybody knows what they're supposed to do versus maybe there's some confusion and uncertainty and things just don't flow smoothly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and it's just, you know, a lot of time for me, it, it meant just go in and, and go and, and talk into people and say, and thank you. Hey, thanks mm -hmm. for doing a good, thanks for doing a good job. And, you know, and you just kind of forget that that means a lot to those that are maybe not always recognized as most, as, yeah. you know, as frequently. Uh, and I might come back and loop and tell a little bit of a more detailed story on that a little bit. The, the fourth and fifth points are, are be willing to think and look at things differently. Mm -hmm. And that's really this idea of, as a leader, you, you have to develop the skills to be able to step outside yourself and look at whatever you're looking at and, and in essence, maybe run through the courses of action yourself or red team yourself on a decision you're about to make. Mm -hmm. if, if if you can do that, I think it, it, it can speed things up a little bit in your decision making. Uh, and it usually makes for better decisions. Now, there's a downside to that for some people is that they can start to analyze too much and, and paralyze wow. themselves. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, and then you, at some point you have to make a decision, take action. Yep. Which goes yep. back to your first point being proactive. Yep. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then the, the final point is really my my favorite one. And it's I'm not perfect. And I don't expect you to be perfect, but I expect which a speaks lot to myself. humility. I have right? you know, I I hope I, I do. I I always hope that that was the impression that, that people got. And it's, you know, by the way, the hardest thing to talk about is humility because it really sounds like you're not very humble if you talk about humility. Yeah. And, uh, so it's I'm a, really humble. I did a great job over here, but I'm 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 humble. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's really yeah. it's, it's kind of tough to talk about, but it's but you know, it's every everybody's the one thing that I'm certain of about me is I'm not perfect. Uh, yeah. And there's one thing I'm certain about, about other people is neither are they. Uh, but I, but I do know that you can expect a lot of yourself. And frankly, people, generally speaking, respond well to being asked more of. And, yeah. and I do think we, you know, I mean, you've led you've led organizations. And I, and I think actually I heard you talk about this one time. And I think that's it's important to set high expectations. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with that at all. You set high Achieve. expectations. You know, and... strive for excellence, but knowing that you will never be perfect. Perfection yeah. is elusive. And yeah. we have to understand that we can drive ourselves crazy if we always strive for absolute perfection. It's not going to happen. But that right. doesn't mean that we can't strive for excellence and achieve. And those are two very different things. Yeah. Yeah. So, so those are my five points. How did you come up with those five? I mean, I know your, your wealth of experience and it, I mean, so many people that you've led uh, during your course of experience, but how did you come up with these five? Because as I've come up with uh, my own leadership points and I, I call them absolutes, you know, my leadership mm -hmm. absolutes. That's um, how we met. It's yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, and I think that that comes with experience. It's not like, yes, I did, you know, you read and you research and you want to, you want to come up with the best points possible. But a lot of it is also from experience, like, mm -hmm. like humility, for example, to me, that is absolutely critical for a, for a strong and effective leader to have some humility, which means you're not going to talk about all of your accomplishments you're going to let your actions speak for themselves. 
And when I hear leaders, you know, self-proposed leaders say, well, I, you know, I did this and this, you know, we were, we were the best ever, or because I led this organization, we were at the top and that was never achieved. I mean, to me, that's like, just let it, if that's all true, that's wonderful, but let it speak for them for itself. Yeah. People you don't have to tell speak. people how great you are. Yeah. People will recognize if you're, if you're doing that well, people will recognize. Yeah, it. absolutely. Um, and if they don't recognize it, maybe you weren't doing as well as you yeah, thought you Exactly. Were. If you have to tell people how great you are, probably not that great. Probably, probably not. <laughs> yeah. So how did you come up with these five, Daryl? Well, and, and this is one of the things I talk to people about. I, I think when you start to take on leadership, leadership positions, and the great thing about the Army is you take, that's what they do with lieutenants, is you go and lead a platoon, mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking. My first leadership um, position was I was called the reconnaissance and survey officer for a field artillery battalion. And that meant I had a team of, uh, I think I had five people. So I made six. So that was a pretty small team. And then I ultimately had a platoon, which was bigger, but it's this, you, you start to accumulate, I think, knowledge once you start to lead. Uh, I've, I, when I talked to young, when I talked to younger soldiers, uh, or I talk to people today, I think if I, if I was blessed with kind of one thing in life, it was an ability to sort of run a, a, a an after action review of what I was doing. Uh, and so really able to, to evaluate how you did based on your, your own experience and your own, you know, own thoughts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's sort of, maybe that's that point of, of uh, of be able to step outside yourself, and so I started started doing that really as a lieutenant because I as I have alluded to you before I wasn't a very good lieutenant. Uh, I was, yeah, I still find that hard to believe. Yeah, but I mean, I was. I mean, I, it wasn't that it was a struggle. It was, but I was. If I was struggling with anything, it's like, well, who am I? And I really, eventually, as a captain. I came to settle on this idea of, look, I'm just going to be myself. And so myself isn't perfect, but I'm a lot more comfortable just being myself. So I, you know, I generally uh, was, you know, optimistic. And I've mm -hmm. always tried to be proactive. I mean, I remember maybe that a little bit about growing up is I'd never like the feeling of stuff just kind of happening to me. I would rather, I would rather be ahead of it mm -hmm. as a, as a Lieutenant, this is maybe this is kind of funny, but in the army, you have to do staff duty officer like once a month or twice a month. Okay. And so when I explain a little bit about what, what that means. Well, it means someone has to be at the unit at all times. So okay. if you have it on the weekend, you're there from like eight in the morning to the next day at eight in the morning. Okay. And you walk around and make sure that nothing's missing and you do some checks and check safes and stuff like that. But one of the things I was in a habit of doing is I would go to my boss's uh, inbox and I would look through the inbox so that the next day or the next week, I knew what was going to be coming my way and I would start <laughs> working on it ahead of time because I could look and go, well, you know, that one's clearly coming. You don't like and, surprises. <laughs> yeah. And I told him that he, we had a big laugh about it because he thought, well, he, he thought, well, that's pretty cool that you, that you do that. Yeah. Uh, and we were and, talking about the physical mail inbox. Yeah, back at the inbox on day. your email. I was pre, <laughs> this was pre email. Uh, it's harder to do today, but at that right. time, you could do it. And and so, uh, you know, I started just kind of thinking, you sort of thinking about leadership. Army's great because it really trains you. You have multiple schools, opportunities to think about it. And, and then, as I was getting ready to go into 
battalion command. So you in the army, you come, you lead some organizations early, mm -hmm. then you just kind of become a staff guy. And now you become a battalion commander and you're going to lead a bigger group of people. And that's the first time I wrote down those five points and that, because mm -hmm. they just, though, as I kind of plowed through my mind, that's what seemed to be important. It was sort of matched to the unit that I was taking over as well. Mm -hmm. But what I found is, is now the succession of units that I commanded afterwards, these five things always seem to kind of jump to the forefront. Different, it, yeah, different I, I, units had different characteristics, but one of these would always touch. Always. And my, my guess is that when you wrote those, wrote these five points down, they, it's not like you had to spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. They were top of mind. Yep. Because when I, when I went to write down, you know, mo my absolutes, I didn't have to think long and hard. It, they just one right after the other, you know, I knew, and I could probably come up with more, but you know, those were the points or the, you know, the absolutes again, as I call them, that I think a strong and effective leader, they have to, they have to embody, you know, and humility is, is certainly something that we've already talked about, but I love yours being optimistic, proactive, um, and address challenges at the lowest level possible. That, that speaks volumes right there. And if you can do that as a, as a leader, you will you will get the respect and earn the credibility. You know, I mean, that's that, I think that's going to go a long way for somebody in a leadership position. Yeah. I had, you know, I was lucky along or blessed. I, luck's not the right word. I was blessed to work with some people and have some people work with me. I had a couple of, I had uh, a couple of Sergeant majors that were just, one one served with me twice at my uh, one star command, and then he came and at my two star command. And one of the things that he stressed over and over and over again was, you you kind of have you you you've got to let people do their job. Just get them to do their job. And then this thing about, you know, expect a lot of them, but you got to get them doing their job, yeah. not somebody else's job, not doing, you know, not doing three other people's jobs, but get them doing their job. And, and on their own, not on micromanaging. Own. Yeah. Right? And, you know, yeah. and when, if, if they're not doing, you know, if they're not, if it's not up to standard, well, then talk to them. Yeah. And start to show them what right looks like. But a lot of times, you know, you'd find that if you got somebody doing the right, what they were actually hired to do, uh, they could they could really do it. Uh, yeah. now, so I'll give you a good, I'll give you, and it's maybe not exactly on the mark, but it's one of the great wins that I saw. Okay. Uh, in a in a organization, and so I took command of an of a organization that was headquartered out in uh, 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 Fort Lewis, Washington. And the and we kind of walked into it. You sort of knew that there were some things that were struggling with, and I found that it was struggling with a lot of things. But one of the areas it struggled with was if you went into the personnel section, you saw that there were really just kind of two people and they were doing, they had way more work to do than they were really capable of doing. Hmm. And then you had, uh, and they were full-time people. So in the Army Reserve, you have some full-time people and then you have some people that are, you know, one weekend a month. Mm -hmm. And the, it, the all of those positions actually weren't filled with anyone. So they so nobody had gone out to look for those people. Well, my sergeant major found the he, he went out and found young soldiers and some young non-commissioned officers to fill those positions. So now mm -hmm. instead of having two people doing a job, 
you ended up, and I want to say the size of the section was 10 people. So now you had 10 people. Well, at first, the two people kind of revolted. Well, I'm going to have to take time to tell these other eight people <laughs> what to do. Yeah, and that's they, not going to, that's going to take longer just than to just do the job. Yeah, and so my <laughs> sergeant major, what he did is he said, well, what do you need for them to be more effective? Well, they all need a place to sit on a computer. The sergeant major said, no problem. You know, so he got them place to set a computer and then they made some other complaints and he made sure he equipped them mm -hmm. uh and so and then uh i ran into one of the two people that was doing all the work mm -hmm. and uh she was so excited after about six months that her, her life was so much happened. better Oh my gosh. And they were this great cohesive team. Mm -hmm. They worked together. If you went to some meeting, they all sat together. They had their own little chant they gave. But most importantly, they really delivered great work. So we went from an organization where people didn't get paid on time, didn't get awards, then a host of things just weren't getting done. Well, that first item is a big deal. Not getting paid on time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Sud suddenly, all of that stuff's happening. The unit, it, it had a true positive impact. So that one kind of touched on uh, several of these points. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but it really started with this idea of getting the whole organization involved. And, and sometimes, and I think you run into this in any place you may work, you'll run into people that, you know, we call them bottlenecks a lot of time and they're great. Well, people. I've heard other names referred, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll go with bottlenecks. That's a nice way of saying it, <laughs> but they'll assume, you know, they're nice people. They're great people and they're willing to always help and they'll just take on more and more but now they're getting less and less done and yeah. you sort of find that, but then get people just doing things. And I tell you in the army, you know, a soldier loves to tell somebody what they're doing. And I didn't pick, that took me actually a long time to kind of pick up on that long. That was one of the things I learned along the way is, Oh yeah. A soldier loves to tell you what he's doing. He or she is doing it and explain mm -hmm. their job and frankly now as things have become more complex systems are more complex they absolutely know more about it than you'll ever know hmm. so it's it's like let them talk let them yeah. tell you about it that's how you learn absolutely yeah. so as you look at the five points and you've indicated that all are are present in a, in a well-run productive organization, but is there one point that you see as maybe stands out as the most important? Like you were going into a dysfunctional organization. Would you say, okay, we got to, we really have to be optimistic and proactive here. That's the first and most important point. Or is there another one that is more important? Yeah, so that the one you just said is important from, I think, from how you carry yourself. So you go in the organization and you're going to have people that are telling you, you know, this, you know, pardon the expression, this place sucks. I've heard that before, you know, and, and no one. Yeah, I've heard worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I believe me, that was the cleaned up version. Uh, the, and, and so you're going to hear that. And so I, I always think about being optimistic and proactive. The optimistic part is how you carry yourself. Proactive is how you do your work. Mm -hmm. and, and you're so you're always trying to, to get ahead of things, whatever your higher organization is. You're trying to stay ahead of them and stay ahead of a host of things. But the last point about I'm not perfect and I don't expect you to be perfect is to me is so, so, so important. And being able to share that with an organization. Uh, if you make a mistake, I remember I, I had, it was 
early in my first two-star command and we had this big conference and at the time it was stressful it was uh we were we absolutely i think as an army at that point thought we were going to go to war and on the korean peninsula and so mm. there was a good bit of stress about organizations that were going to have to support that if that were to happen and that okay. meant you were really identifying lots of holes in the organization where there's people or equipment or just how you did things. Right. And so I have this big commander's conference where I've got, had a whole room full of people. There's probably a hundred people in attendance. Oh, okay. A couple, a couple of my support staff subordinates kind of got me spun up on an issue. And I walked into the room and I slammed a book down and I just, you know, I just like started going blah, 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 blah. totally. That's really not me, except if I get spun up on something mm -hmm. <laughs> right before <laughs> something's about to happen, right? A yeah. Big con yeah. You know, a conference or decision to be made or whatever. And I, I knew, I mean, I, I knew as soon as that happened, that wasn't, that wasn't right. And so we kind of finished the first hour and I take a break and I stand up at the start of the second hour and I go to the whole group. And it was really, I was upset with one person okay, mm. or three, three people actually, but I, the guys, the guy y'all spun up. Yeah. Two, those two. And then it was about one other subordinate leader. Uh, uh -huh. And I, so I stood up first and I apologized sincerely to the whole group. I said, that's not what you need to see. It's not what you need to hear. What you need to see from me is that I'm, is that I'm calm and focused and that we're going to fix problems. You know, we're just going to mm -hmm. get after the problems that we have we're going to work through it. But mostly my actions were inappropriate. And I hope that you will forgive me because that's all you can say is I hope that you will forgive me. Right. And then right. the next break, I pulled these three people aside and I talked to them. The two, I said, look, if we're getting ready to do something, that's not the time to get me spun up about something that's really kind of trivial. And then to the other person yeah. I really talked to and I said, look, you could have handled something better, but I, you didn't deserve to hear that. Uh, well done. I, well, and I tell you, I think, you know, you, if you watch the news and periodically see things where commanders are, are, uh, they're removed from suspended from command or whatever. And I would, and, and all for various reasons, but when it's about how do you talk to people, and interact with people i would contend most of the time it's in a setting like that or a you know a meeting or whatever and the leader never doesn't ever come back and say hey i was wrong right and, exactly and, people, and it's a tendency of people to view that apology as weakness i think i've found over time that it's you know it's a it's a positive. It's not a weakness. It's, yeah, it's we're not, a we're not strength that you can. To your that. point, yeah, we're not perfect. And and, and I, for a yeah. leader to speak up and say, "Hey, I made a mistake here, and I hope you forgive me, and we're going to move on." I, yeah. You know, I realize the the mistake that I made, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna move on from there, and. Uh, you know, hopefully in a positive direction. I, I think that speaks volumes because too often today you don't, and a good segue to the next question I have for you, you don't see leaders of organizations or certainly politicians ever or rarely apologize. Mm -hmm. Rarely will they come back and say, yeah, I really, I really misread that situation. You know, I apologize for that. And I, Rarely and I, does that happen. 
Yeah, and I think it's a, I think it gets back to this thing is there's this perception in society today that that's showing weakness, and you can't show weakness. And I would just tell you, there's you know there's well, I mean, uh, you know, think about think about Jesus. Frequently, he he showed what some people would would identify as is weakness because really mm -hmm. it's humility. And there's a tremendous difference between being weak and being humble. Oh, yeah. You yes. know, and I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's there's biblical scholars that can talk about that much better. But this idea of being humble, it it does, it matters. And it matters to people that are around you, mm -hmm. you know, and it leads to how do you how do you treat people? You know, it's like, I think one of the things that surprised me over the last few years is we're having to legislate or dictate, if you're inside of an organization, things that should be common. Uh, it should be common to treat others with dignity and to respect them respect their opinions, respect them as a human being, respect mm -hmm. a whole host of things. Right. The organization's got to have standards. You know, it's going to have some standards that people have to abide by. Hopefully. But, but <laughs> just, yeah, just treating. Doesn't people, always happen, but yes. Yeah, yeah right. just treating people with this idea that, that everybody matters. You shouldn't have to legislate that should just be should just be common and kind of common sense I really guess, i guess that's the you know the golden the golden rule or a host of a well, host of things about you know if if it's how i would want to be treated then i should treat others that way maybe absolutely even more so. So yeah and i try to keep top of mind when i when i'm talking to one person or a group I try to keep on the you know top of mind that at the end of that conversation or at the end of that situation, whatever it is, I want those folks or that person to walk away thinking at least neutral, you know, like, man, I, you know, I, I never want them to think, geez, I, I'm sorry that I even ran into Newkirk, you know, wow, what a jerk. <laughs> I want them to walk away with, I'm really glad that I had a chance to talk to Jeff, you know, mm -hmm. and that, you know, it, things are, I feel better having had that conversation or having heard what he had to say. Yeah. And so, you know, I, if I keep that in the forefront of my mind, more times than not, I think it's going to turn out positively. But there have been situations where, you know, as you said, you get spun up or whatever, somebody hits you with uh, some surprise information before you're going to go into a, uh, whether it's a presentation or, a, or an important discussion and you are completely lost focus, you know, and when you lose focus and I lose that keeping, you know, top of mind, adding value to people and to situations, it's probably not going to turn out the way I wanted it to. Yeah. And so as yeah. leaders, we always have to be, um keeping things in proper perspective because life and our, our environment anything can get us off our game yeah you can't you know that's you can't control everything so no you know, if you're proactive you can probably influence things and if you do what you're supposed to do well, you can you can influence some things, but you can't control everything. And so no. your response to those occasions is really what, the, especially the higher up you go in leadership, whether it's, you know, whether it's in a hospital uh, or a, a logistics company or the military, it it's really how you respond to things that becomes more and more important. You know, the, if, right. you know, the farther down you are, middle management or, or lower, you know, company grade leadership in the army, uh, you know, you're supposed to, you know, part of that is you got to get things done. 
You know, you get the mission, you got to get things done. You got to motivate and influence people to get stuff done. And that's hard. It's, it's, that's tough. Mm -hmm. You move on up. And now it's really about, Hey, how am I going to set conditions for my people to be more successful? And, and you do that, you know, you do that a number of ways. I think my, my five points were really what I tried to get, was trying to get to at that, be proactive, get a, mm -hmm. always try to stay ahead, get up, get as many people involved as you can. Uh, make sure that those people that are overlooked the most, you know, the personnel people and the log logisticians, you may make sure everybody knows that they're important to this decision. Right. Uh, and, and, and then this idea of just setting up a, a culture of, Hey, look, none of us are going to get it right the first time. And, and that also that adds this idea of you get more people trying to solve problems. If they know they're not going to get killed because they're not perfect, they will always see to try new ways of getting something done better. Yeah. And then they'll is... come back later and say, Hey, sir, I didn't know if you knew this, but we had changed doing it this from this way to this way. And, uh, it's, and it's working better. And it's yeah. like, oh, I didn't know y'all were doing it. Awesome. Great. You know, they're That's allowed your... to think out of the box a little bit and yeah, come up with new innovative ways to, to do things. Yeah. So and... it, yeah, when you, when... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so I was just going to segue to the next question. And that is, as we look out in uh, business, if there's any organization out there or even maybe government, locally, state, do you see, not a loaded question, uh, but do you see at all uh, organizations out there that really embody these five points? Uh, well, I, you know, I think lots and lots of military organizations still mm -hmm. embody these five points. I mean, look, I, that's I comforting kind of, to hear. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in the military. I, that was, that was where I lived a lot of my life. Uh -huh. And, and so if I was seeing something one way I could count on, there were like, literally thousands who were seeing it the same way because you're going through the same training you're going through stuff and so mm -hmm. i really do like to believe that the military is where you'd see you'd still see this embodied i actually i believe you would still not just that you would see it i actually believe that you absolutely would see it uh that, that doesn't it's mean good. that that's good to hear. Know, yeah, it doesn't mean the military isn't having to digest some different problems. Uh the well, we all know that that's that's the case. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's things that you're asked to do that are different. Uh there are then then maybe have been asked of you before or they're handled a different way than than you were asked to handle something before. Mm -hmm. uh, the complexity of systems, and this is my opinion, I think the complexity of systems has gone too far. And the, the not only the return on the investment, but the ability to optimize some of these very, very complex systems is it's almost like you're getting diminishing returns mm -hmm. from it because they've just become too complex. And so some simplicity might might help us a bit uh, uh i'm think, always for simple yeah keep it simple you, yeah i think you see i do think though you know societally we see organizations that are struggling uh more and more with some of these with some of these things i think you know part of it and i'm a you know hey i'm a i'm a good capitalist but i do think you have to question or ask yourself people that are at the top of organizations that are making so much more money than their, than those that work for them. 
you do yeah, I don't... have to ask a fundamental question of is is one I think you have to say well, is, are they really humble are they really sorry phone ringing in the background oh. <laughs> you're an important guy <laughs> well the question that comes to my mind is is that person who is making that level of compensation which is far greater the range today between entry level mid mid manager all the way up to ceo is is greater now than it ever has been in in the history of business and i think that's a pretty safe statement to make and so is that person that's at the top are they really providing the value and the return to warrant that level of compensation because it is so far off the charts yeah and i mean you go through for profit uh nonprofit i mean i'm thinking of you know i spent time in healthcare some of the folks that are in the c suites in some of these big health systems i think some people would be surprised what the level of compensation is for some of those folks yeah i think it's a i mean i think it's a challenge that that people i mean i'm in a you know I'm, i just think it's something that people have to consider so you don't want it i don't want it legislated i'm not arguing no, i'll never argue no. for legislating hey you can only make this much money and, and i don't want to say that there aren't people out there that may deserve it yeah you know I, you know i kind of thought when you said this i'm gonna pat a guy and i know him because we were platoon leaders together many many years ago but uh the 7-eleven corporation and this guy is now ceo of 7-eleven uh, if you just sort of see that he actually tries to hear yeah what what the individual store owners uh or operators are saying it appears that he's doing you know, he's trying to do things proactively that make sure that, that those stores remain as profitable as they can be. So over the last few years, you've seen them offer different food offerings mm -hmm. at a 7-Eleven, uh, different types of coffees. I mean, these are little things, but I know. Yeah, but they add up. Yeah, they add up. Know, so I know Joe DePinto, and he grew, he, he started in the Army, he went to West Point. He, he served in the army for a while and then he really learned his craft as he went to work for various uh i think he worked for pepsico for a while and some other places but he was learning along the way mm -hmm. and and now you sort of i at least i think now so if somebody calls you up and goes hey i work at a 7-eleven it's not it's not as guthrie described this is guthrie <laughs> looking at it from outside it really looks like they're doing a lot of these things because because i think it's also hard you know if you're the head of a of a super big corporation that's spread out it's mm -hmm. hard to be seen by those that matter most you know yeah. it's hard to it's hard you to bet. get around places it's hard to be seen and if you are seen sometimes it can be viewed as oh well it's just a photo op but if you are if you are really intentional about going out to the front lines of the business that word will spread yeah you know if you don't yeah. just just not for a photo op but you're actually there to to really understand what what are these folks experiencing? How can I make their lives better? And at the same time, make the company better. And that, whether you make it to every 7-Eleven or not, that word will spread. And I yep. think that that has a lot of meaning to the people that work within that within that business. And yeah. and that, that speaks very, very highly to number one, and that is being proactive. Because it, it, you really have to be on top of it and thinking ahead, and know that you know we're no, nothing is going to be perfect, but the only way that we can improve is to gain um, insight and information and talk to the people.
you know, get out of the ivory tower, get out to the front lines and know people, know, help them understand that you really care about them. You're there for them. Yeah, it makes a I, world of difference. It, it, it does. I mean, it's, you know, I, I always, <laughs> you know, my last couple of years in the army was in COVID. And so maybe for a year of that two years of travel restrictions and you just didn't get to see people. Mm -hmm. You couldn't travel to see people. And it was that was hard. And I don't ever say no, you know, I don't I don't know that I was ever the most visible leader to to everyone, but I can say one thing. I always enjoyed if I got out to see people and been able to talk to them outside of a building standing on a weapons range you know for people to fire their weapons uh or you know just kind of meet people wherever they do their work i i did always enjoy that and uh, but it's getting out you know you gotta just you, you gotta be supportive of supportive of people and so I, it's they're they're out i mean there are organizations that are out there that are doing all these things and doing them well. Mm -hmm. uh, Good. I would say there, but I would love to see a real commitment from business, from business leaders to, to think about this idea of, Hey, how do I raise, how do I make the boat float higher for everybody? Yeah. Yeah. You know, my, maybe my boat. Floats Perfect a little, point. Perfect floats a little point. Deeper in the water, but everybody's <laughs> boat floats a little higher. Yeah. So to that point, are there, uh, well, let me ask this question. If you were presented with an opportunity to coach somebody, any, any leader out there, uh, and I mean any organization, government, any leader uh, on these five points, who, who do you think uh rises to the top who would you want to meet with and and really spend some time talking about these five points oh man and it doesn't mean they would listen <laughs> <laughs> because we know that there are plenty of, of folks out there that are in their leadership positions but are not receptive to hearing any constructive criticism or anything that might help them move forward or improve but that said is there anybody out there Wow, that's boy, that's a that's a. I know a you have to. Okay, should I answer this truthfully, or am I going to take hard, the high road? Hard, <laughs> that's a really, really hard question. Let me say, how about this? Uh, I would, I would love to. Uh, I'd love to sit down with a lot of our political leaders in our country today. Uh, I would hope they'd be receptive. <laughs> and, and just and and just say, yeah. You know, there's, I mean, I. So there's a whole. In, uh, there's industries that have developed around things, and you get results that that lead to, gosh, that doesn't seem as pleasant as it used to be. Now I don't know if politics has ever been pleasant, but now there's an industry that's run, gr grown up around it to include a lot of the media, which, you know, sort of chimes in to one side or the other and echoes over and over again, things that are either, or usually bad, you know, the media only echoes what's bad. Yeah. And so, so that's not good. That's an industry. Uh, the wedding industry uh, is probably, <laughs> probably one that leaves you sort of like, well, people got married for ages and ages and ages, and you never heard about a, a groomzilla or a bridezilla yeah. <laughs> or anything like that until it sort yeah. of cost a tremendous amount of money. And sometimes people don't, you know, don't have the. Well, money. I've got my own Actually, opinion on that, you know? but uh, I've but got I've, two two daughters that are, you know, someday probably going to get married, and my my old thinking is. Keep it all in perspective. At the end of the day, you want to you want to say you're married. Mm -hmm. I don't care how many people see it or what the venue is like. 
that's the whole objective of the day. So let's keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, I, but, but, but you, we've lost but you, perspective. Yeah, but you know, with with that with that said, and I and I really I really mean this is. Do you imagine what a profound thing it would be if uh, the you know the two likely candidates for president like got on TV and and actually said, here's what I like about the other person and could say it in a way where people went, wow, I think he actually meant that. Uh, wow. I, I mean, what a, what a, <laughs> you know, what a disruptive behavior that would be because we don't, we don't see that. I think well, if we went back 40 years, we might have a chance yeah. to see, there might be some possibility that we'd see elements of that, mm -hmm. you know, one politician complimenting the other in some way today, I I don't have really much hope that that would ever happen. No, I don't. Well, I don't either. Unfortunately. And, I, and, and so I, you know, what I'd say is, is, Hey, I got five little simple points. Some of those, I so be optimistic. I mean, I was, uh, the first time I got to vote was in the, the 1980 presidential election. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not everybody that listens to this would, ever would have seen Ronald Reagan. They will see video clips of him, but but we grew up when he was the president. Yep. And there was an optimism about about him, just a just an optimism. Um, mm -hmm. There have been. I was people. never. I mean, I know I was young at the time and and just learning, but I, there was never a time where he was speaking and I was afraid of what he was going to say. Yeah. You know, like like. He, he he'd go off on some tangent that you were like, where is he going with this? You know, you might not agree with his policy, but I uh, really, I never, I can't remember one time thinking, what in the world is he saying? Because he was so well-spoken and yeah. so professional. And, and he, I mean, I think he even said he always tried to be a gentleman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we do yeah. not see that today. And that's the thing, you know, if you think about that, you get, you just, if you're, again, you treat people nicely, you're positive, you know, you're positive about the, the future, you're positive, or you're just a positive person, you add in a little pro, you know, just being proactive to, to stay ahead of, to stay ahead of things instead of of reactive because there's one thing I've certainly learned in life is that being reactive, you, you really get to identify lots of imperfectness, but because it hit stuff hits you. And now you have to start just reacting to what hits you. Uh, and, and that's, and then it makes it that much more difficult for every, for the whole organization and for people in that organization, if you're not just leaning forward a little bit, I mean, you know, I don't advocate, don't try to figure out what's going to happen 15 years from now. You should certainly have a vision for where you're trying to head in the future. Right. Uh, but, you know, but if you are total, totally in reaction mode, uh, you're going to be uh, more, absurd you're going to be more whatever and you're yeah. going to have sharp elbows and you're going to be rough and and just and then not make it about you uh that's i think that well you're thing. always on the defensive when you, if you're reactive you're always on the defensive and yeah it's yeah. you're always trying to you know deflect what's ever been pointed at you because you're in you're in reaction mode you're not trying to be um, you know, moving forward, just yeah. trying to and, get through whatever happened. And then be, and then finally, I mean, just humility, 
I mean, it's again, like I said earlier, it's hard to talk. It's a hard, it's one of the hardest subjects I think to talk about is humility, but, but you just gotta be, you gotta be humble. You gotta know you don't know it all. None of us do. Right. Uh, and how you interact with other people. If you do that from kind of a humble place. And I did, I, I think I mentioned this at the end of the last episode. So I was blessed to work under this one guy uh, multiple times. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I met him for the first time in Bosnia, as it turned out, but then worked com commanded organizations under him. And, and, and so what was his name? Of, his name's Mark McQueen. Mm -hmm. And and as a civilian, Mark uh, was the, for when I first met him, he was the chief financial officer for a, for a big church. And then he became the city manager of Panama city on a Monday mm -hmm. and then on Thursday, a hurricane hit. Uh, and he's now the superintendent of the Bay County schools, which is the, the County that Panama city part is in. And the one thing I can tell you about Mark is so maybe go back to the very first question. how did you develop some of these? Mm -hmm. well, I certainly rounded them out by watching Mark McQueen because mm -hmm always optimistic all ab absolutely always proactive trying to look for better ways of doing things or if he saw an opportunity he taught me started teaching me things about how to manage a budget in the military mm -hmm. he started i didn't know he was doing it but he started doing that when i was was a colonel and then a and then a one-star commander because then I commanded two-star organizations where I actually had budget authority. I mm -hmm. developed a budget. I had to execute that budget. But he did all those things ahead of time. Quite a mentor. Yeah. And at the same time, the most humble person. And the thing I always remember about him, and I always for, forgot to do this because I just wasn't him. But if you went, if we went out to eat somewhere as a group, uh, at the end of dinner, whoever, if, if someone had been our, our, our waiter or waitress and had done a really good job, he would get the man, he'd go, Hey, can you get the manager, have the manager come over, have the waiter or waitress there and tell them what a great job they did. And to their boss, right? Wow. And it's like, that person's now glowing, but most of all, he meant it. I mean, I got to know him and I knew. I he love that. It. He meant that every is great. word of it. And you know what? He, I think he'll probably have a great impact on schools in Bay County, Florida, just because he believes in people. People that do that kind of thing well, fundamentally believe in people. And you're being people, sincere. Yeah. People will see that. It's just like yeah. if you're not sincere, people see that too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the one point that I wish that you could to could really emphasize and 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 talk talk about with our two leading candidates for, for president is number five. Yeah. They are not perfect. That's right. That's right. And again, it's back to this <laughs> thing of some somewhere. I'm not Somewhere. sure they under, they realize that though. <laughs> yeah, there's this confusion about showing we again, it's back to this confusion yeah. about showing we can never be vulnerable, right? Yeah, it's it's like uh you know, if you mess up, just tell people you messed up. Yeah. If you uh if you know, think about think about the change and how Texans might feel about the, the current president if he said yeah my, my policies down at down at the border have not been good i was trying something and i messed up but i'm going to work hard between now and whatever i leave office to get it get it fixed and don't talk about money <laughs> don't talk about other uh... people just just say just say, hey, I 
you know, and now, by the way, you don't get to be president by, by, I, somebody said this one time, I think it's true. Look, you don't get to be president if you don't have an ego. And you don't get to wow. be president if you don't think what you're doing is right. Uh, but I think you have to recognize when those times when you get something wrong and you don't always have to fight back oh, against that. And really and just say, and just say, hey, you know, some, and, and I think, hey, on the board, you could go, hey, 40% of the people actually think, the actions I'm taking are right, but it's this other 60% of people. We're going to get this right. I mean, just think about how that would sound. It's like, it's like, I mean, I've been on the receiving it's, end of like a rear end chewing because I did something wrong along mm -hmm. the way. And, and to just go, Hey, uh, sir, ma'am, depending on who's above me, you know what? You're right. Uh, I, I didn't get it right. And I may have let you down, but I'm going to work to get it right. And you know what? Nine times out of 10, at least in the military, they would want to help me get, get whatever it was right. Well, if you're sincere so, and genuine in that statement, most in most situations, most people will want to help you move forward. You yeah. know, they will want, they'll, they'll see that you are really trying and that you are, you know, your humility is speaking volumes by saying, hey, I screwed up, didn't do it the way I should have, but I'm going to learn from it and I'm going to do better. And I want the result in the future to be much better than it is today. And yeah. I think if we had politicians that would say that, uh, I don't care what office you're running for, I think that would make a huge, huge difference. But that's, I mean, hopefully we'll see that at some point in the future. I don't see yeah, that happening I, today, but boy, that would be great if it did. Yeah, it, so I'm going to take on point number one, be optimistic. And I'm optimistic that that's where we're going to hear that someday. Yeah. Yeah. No, I am, look, I am too. And I think, Hey, look, there, if you look around there, there are people that are trying There yeah. are businesses that are trying. I'm on a, I'm on a nonprofit board with them business owner up in uh, magnolia and he runs a pretty that's north of houston for our listeners oh are yeah not in texas <laughs> well it helps me too just a little bit i had to live too long <laughs> and i don't know exactly where it is but i know the day and you know he is the most sincere uh leader that i've heard talk about just you know how to deal with people yeah, he described he described to us, you know, he had a he had an employee that he said, you know, we had probably promoted them, you know, one one step beyond, you know, their capabilities for that job. And said, you know, and then it was coming out that that was happening. And, you know, and, and it's hard if you ever get in a job where you're not you're really struggling. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Now you get into this thing where I want to show everybody, blah, blah, blah. And he, he talked about the conversation he had with this employee. And it was so loving. I mean, it was like, you know, you've been with this company for 20 years. And, but, but this isn't the job for you. But I want you to know there's, there is a job for you in this company. So you don't have to worry about losing your job. We just got to get you in the right place. Well, imagine how that person felt by hearing that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, just think about that kind of conversation with someone. And not what it just means to that person, but what it means to other people in the organization. Yeah, you that don't makes, have to worry. makes them feel safe. Yeah, you don't have to worry about so much turnover. You got people that are going to stick with you. I mean, that's just that's just a good... I mean, that's just being a good leader. And that's, you know, that's in an aerospace company. And then I described a guy that that runs the the, the 7-Eleven corporation and then a guy in a, that, that that's now the superintendent of schools. 
they're each having impacts on people that they touch. Mm -hmm. And one, and some of those people, hey, some of those people may end up being politicians, Jeff. <laughs> and and, and if we that's can the be case, then yeah, we can be optimistic that they'll be good people that that care and they won't about change. others, that care and about gonna... everybody, not just yes. those that want to hear what they say, but care about everybody. That's mm -hmm. what that's what we've got to got. I think. When we get it, people get into politics, and uh, maybe at least initially they're passionate about something, they're sincere, but sometimes they get influenced in different ways, and then that sincerity kind of kind of wanes a bit. Yep. So for those getting into politics, I hope they their passion and sincerity continues no matter what. Amen. Uh, so. Amen. Man, this has been great discussion. Daryl Guthrie, thank you so much for coming on Game Changers. Two episodes and both excellent, excellent conversations. So thank you uh, again uh, for your service, for your time coming on the podcast. And I'd like to open up the invitation for future episodes if you're up for it, because I think I, I think we could just talk forever about different parts of leadership, politics, whatever, but it would be great to have you back at some point in the future if you're up for you, it. You can always count on that. Jeff, I count you as a friend, so thank you so, back so at much you. for having me. You I've bet. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Same here. Thank you. All right, listeners, thank you so much for tuning in to Game Changers. I appreciate you so much for taking the time to listen to Game Changers and all the guests that I've had on and Daryl Guthrie, one of uh, one of the very best genuine people that you're going to get to know uh, and learn from on this podcast. So please, please check out both episodes. Um, again, thank you listeners for tuning in Game Changers. Today was a great day. And tomorrow, I know, is going to be even better. Peace, everyone. <laughs>